Rover launch program now commencing. What do you know about me, Richard? Good evening, Mr. Bond fans, and welcome to a video that is a sequel, follow-up, grudge match, depending on how you want to frame this, uh, to a previous video um, on Quantum of Solace, which you can see over on the Bond Experience YouTube channel. And speaking of the Bond Experience, here is uh, the man himself, Mr. David Zaritsky. How are you? I'm doing fine. I'm doing it. Calvin, thank you for having me back after such a vicious battle last time. Uh, yeah, I know. Well, the, the scars just about healed and, you know, the bruises have vanished. So I, I think we're all right to go for, uh, for round two now. So the last time Perfect. you were staunchly defending Quantum of Solace against my shots. And now the shoe is on the other foot because I'm going to be the one defending this film, Moonraker. So this is kind of your revenge, I guess, because you're not a huge fan of this one. Am I right? I'm I'm really not. I mean, there's a small place in my heart, but it's this tiny corner room with like no closet space. So yeah, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> okay, well, we've got a few topics to cover, I think. And I kind of wanted to start with perhaps the most polarizing one of all, just to start us off lightly. Um, sci-fi or science fact as Cubby Broccoli likes yeah. to position Moonraker. Um, not science fiction, <laughs> we're, we're science facts. A that was different. spot on impersonation. That was fantastic. Well, we're not science fiction, we're in fact science fact. Um, because the, the very fact that James Bond goes into outer space in this film, there are lasers. Like that tends to be one of the more polarizing aspects of it. Where do you stand? Because I know you are a Star Wars fan, so I know you're not a sci-fi prude by any stretch. No, no, I give me a, a huge helping of Star Wars and sci-fi. I don't know if it has a place with James Bond. And, and I guess more importantly, when it comes to Moonraker as a movie, the, the issue I have with it is it's purely a reaction from Eon and, and Jan Jack to Star Wars. So, I mean, you know, I have, and this, this starts the <laughs> cascade of issues, I have an issue because it feels like truly they force fit Bond into, you know, the Hollywood pattern. And I always felt like Bond would push that away and say, I'm going to do my own thing. And here you had this amazing book called Moonraker, with an amazing plot. I mean, arguably, it's one of everybody's favorite plots. And instead of following it along, like Honor Majesty's Secret Service and some of these other ones, they said, you know what? You know what? Let's take the Star Wars realm. Even, and we'll get to it, I'm sure, shot for shot, felt like it was taken from Star Wars. But the biggest issue I have with the science fiction, science facts thing is they just put the Star Wars wrapper on it on, on The Spy Who Loved Me. To me, this is almost a doppelganger, and I could go over piece by piece of The Spy Who Loved Me. Oh yeah, I, I mean, that's a, that's a hard thing for me to defend. I mean, it is very much, it's the same writer coming back, Christopher Wood as well, and it does very much feel like, well, the last one was a success, so let's do that, but give it this Star Wars skin. I will say though, that it is not like, Pretty much every film in the Roger Moore era does a bit of this. Like, Live and Let Die, obviously, takes a lot of inspiration from black exploitation. Man with the Golden Gun is like your kung fu bond. Mm -hmm. Even The Spy Who Loved Me is very much influenced by, like, I know this is going to sound strange, but water. And specifically Steven Spielberg's mm -hmm. Jaws, which at that point was, like, I think still the biggest film of all time when the Spy Who Loved Me came out. And so that is why that film is kind of latching onto that trend. Right. And Moonraker does the same thing and kind of latches onto the Star Wars aspect. I agree, but the problem I have with Moonraker versus the other ones that you just named is mm -hmm. they still deliver something unique. So although they're thematic, like Moonraker is space thematic, the other ones deliver something new. Whereas, I mean, literally in the beginning of Moonraker, there is, you know, a stealing 
of a shuttle. Hmm, where have I heard that from? Oh, The Spy Who Loved Me, where they stole a sub right in the beginning. And then, I mean, it just goes on and on from there. And you and Live Twice, though. Like, if, if we remember, if we're going to go that far back, like, that also opens with the shuttle coming in and um, stealing the other one. So I think that is just a Lewis Gilbert kind of trait. And I'm kind of all right with it, because I feel like Bond films tend to, structurally, they tend to fit into certain boxes. And all of the Lewis Gilbert ones fit into this, like, really fantastical megalomaniac wants to, and all you have to really do is go and like change the nouns, like steals, you know, cross out submarine, put spaceship above it. Right. Um, but it is, depending on what those elements are, I, it is more dependent on whether or not I have a good enough time. And uh, I just so happen to love all the elements at play in Moonraker. So even them going into space, which I know it's really silly. And particularly what you said about, um, the Fleming novel, which I think is quite revered as one of the very best of Fleming's works, has right. very little to do with this film. And right. they must have just been so like pleased with themselves that they hadn't used that title for one of the films yet. Because even the Spy Who Loved Me ends by saying, the next Bond film is for your eyes only. And then yeah. obviously they changed it to Moonraker because I guess they thought, huh, space is big. What do we have left? Ah, Moonraker, fortunately enough. And the guilt can be found squarely in the gentleman that you opened up with. You know, Cubby Broccoli sat there, and there's film of him saying this, and he said, you know, in the, in the, in the book Moonraker, you just had a measly rocket. We have all of this. And he was talking about the opulence and the locations and, you know, you, one rocket in a book, I'll give you six shuttles and spacemen in outer space. And it's like, but why? You know, was it always about you know, overeating, you know, going to the buffet and, and coming out sick. And that's what Moonraker sometimes feels like. It was just too much of one thing. Mm, mm. I Ooh. agree with I agree with you, apart from the coming out sick bit. <laughs> so I've, I've had many a nice stuffing at a buffet every now and then, and I, could, I can come out quite pleased. And that's what, like, I know that Moonraker is like Bond at its worst in terms of excess, because it is just throwing everything um, that is, you know, potentially opulent or big budget or, or whatever, spectacle wise. But I kind of love that. Yeah. Um, I love that they do all of this crazy stuff and the effects work and all that kind of um, kind of thing. So I'm kind of all for that with Bond every once in a while. I would much rather have my Bond be like this than you know, more like Fior Eyes Only, for instance, which is yes. much smaller scale. I prefer this kind of massive uh, fantastical realm. So. How far is too far, if I may ask you a question with that bigger than life? Because one of the things I noticed when rewatching this was, and I'm a brand guy, I mean, you know that about me, is that the, the overbearing nature of these like PR and branding, I mean, literally when they're going up that winding path in the <laughs> ambulance, it's like 7-Eleven and Seiko and British Airways and, you know, Jaws crashes through the, the, the Rio thing and 7-Up. It's like... <laughs> I mean, but even for you, wasn't that a little too much? Okay, that, that is, I cannot defend that, that they are quite clearly just going past billboards with like a big Marlboro cigarette packet on it. And, you know, obviously one of the bad guys goes flying into the British Airways sign. At least that one is a joke. Like, I think that yes. that's quite a funny reveal that he's stuck in the mouth. For most of the other stuff, it is just really gratuitous product placement. And I can't say it bothers me too much, but I do end the film every time coming away with this, like a subliminal feeling of like, I really want to buy a watch. I want to smoke some cigarettes, <sighs> book a it's working. British Airways it's working. trip. <laughs> exactly. D does that kind of stuff really bother you when it's so in your face like it is in Moonraker? I'd like it to be a little subtle. It's not the, it's not the crux of what disconnects we me with Moonraker. I mean, mm. I think I think my biggest issues with Moonraker are not the little things like the the PR campaigns that they clearly, you know, pushed in there. It's it's the replication, like I talked about. I mean, you can mm. literally go through almost scene by scene and say, well, that's the spy who loved me. Even, you know, falling in love with another agent and some of the discussions that they've had yeah. is from the spy who loved me. So it was like, all right, we want it to be in outer space, but we know we have a winning formula with the spy who loved me. We'll make Moonraker. That's the biggest issue I have. No, I, I can see that. There are enough differences for me that it doesn't bother me too much. I think that 
Well, let's get into it because you kind of um, okay. touched upon it there. The um, the whole love interest angle, because Lois Childs as Dr. Holly Goodhead was one of the topics that I really want to discuss because I think that that character is an improvement on Anya from The Spy Who Loved Me. And I think in the sense that The Spy Who Loved Me is kind of framed around it's, you know, a Western agent teaming up with an Eastern agent at the height of the Cold War. That is a fantastic uh, breeding ground for conflict and, and they kind of play with that a bit, but not quite. And she's presented as being Bond's equal, but she doesn't really do much fighting. She still gets sort of tied to a chair at the end of the film and needs saving. So she's not that, she's not like Wei Lin, for instance, who is yeah. someone who could very much hold her own. Similar to Lois Charles's Dr. Goodhead, who I think is, um, I think they try to keep the conflict going but this time they frame it in more of a man versus woman kind of way. And I think yeah. that Roger Moore doesn't often have character arcs in his films, but I think in this one he does and in its relation to Goodhead, because at the start of it, he's all like, ah, a woman, or, you know, you're not just a pretty lady and whatever he is he has to say about that. But then by the end of the film, he sees her like kicking ass on the spaceship and all that kind of stuff. And yet just, it's a very quick moment, but there are a few shots where he just has this look of like, huh, you're all right, actually. Maybe I've misjudged you. And uh, he doesn't make any more quips about her competency after that point. Um, so how do you feel about Dr. Goodhead? So I'm going to combine my feelings on something because I, I actually agree with you, but I'll, I'll take it one step further in my delight on this. I, I think that in watching Roger Moore, when I first started watching this, I thought, he's really a smart ass in this. Mm. Like he cuts people off and he, he acts the expert on everything. He's like, you know, that's the orchid of da 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 da. It's like, you know, listen, you know it all wise ass. <laughs> but I really do think once he meets her and you have the tit for tat, which again, he's being that glib snarky person at the beginning of the movie, there is a character arc where he learns, you know, fallibility and, you know, working with her and trust. And then towards the end, she's doing her own kicking of the ass and he's just giving her almost like a colleague appreciative nod, not like, a, oh, a woman hit a man. And using her sex, using her femininity, even in the ambulance, that was really kind of her idea. And mm. so I think the strength is played well. So I gave you a bonus. I not only liked <laughs> her, I liked the character arc that they brought Bond through. It wasn't just the quippy Roger Moore, Moore arched eyebrow. Mm. No, I, I completely agree. Okay, that's one point in my corner. <laughs> I'll give you one out of the 16 I made already. <laughs> I do, but I, I do concede that it, it, I think it works on the, you know, gender politics um, side of things. It doesn't, it's not as elegant as East versus West because she is a CIA agent and they do try to do a bit of like, who are you really working for kind of thing, but yeah. That doesn't really work because it's like, well, James, you have a very well-established friend who works at the CIA. Why don't you just, you know, make a phone call and, check, you know, oh, by the way, there's this agent who's uh, kind of following me around. Is she one of yours after all? And then that would kind of solve that. Yeah, um, agreed. Doesn't bother me too much. But... Clearly. <laughs> so let's talk about Roger Moore himself then, because I, I, I do feel like this is his best performance as James Bond. This is him at his most kind of pitch perfect for me. Um, you know, he's not in the state he is in A View to a Kill, where he does seem a bit too old for it. Mm. He's not quite, you know, in Live and Let Die and Man with the Golden Gun, they were figuring out who he is exactly. Here, I do think he's just so perfectly well pitched with the moments of humor and um, the badass kind of stuff as well. How do you feel about that? I think, I think it's good. Like I just made a remark on, I do like the arc that they showed, whether it was purposeful or not. Mm. Um, I don't think it holds the level of respect that maybe you have because I, I loved him in Live and Let Die. Mm. I loved him as kind of, you know, this, this reboot character um, that was both charming, but fallible, you know, the anti-hero type. Mm. Um, likable for all the wrong reasons, as I like to say with my, my favorite Bond moments. <laughs> and then The Spy Who Loved Me, I really do think that was a crescendo for him in the sense that he was that very sure, very confident Bond that was also full of intrigue. To me, I actually blame the movie on me not appreciating more, more in mm. this movie. And I'll tell you why, because it feels like he is on a mission, so I do like that aspect. You have M send him out on a mission. But I feel like the rest of the movie, he kind of just stumbles into it. 
you know, from all of a sudden being in a boat and being chased to following a girl through the forest to asking about why Drax is doing this. And Drax, within a 15 second second, explains the plot to the audience. Like, what? Yeah. So I do feel like the plot and environment didn't serve him well. You are very right about the plot. It is one of the loosest, I think, in all of Bond. Like, uh, I just got sort of done kind of like writing up a big in-depth review of Octopussy, which I've never really looked at in such forensic detail before. But that plot is so intricate and depending on these tiny little things and moments and things you might not quite pick up on. Whereas Moonraker is so much, okay, we've got this clue, go to that place. And some of the stuff is like me saying, you know, uh, David, the next clue on this you know treasure hunt is uh, new york city go there and find it and it's like you would turn up there and be like well wh wh where do i go what do i because and then that's what bond does in this film it's like oh we can find the the flan the pl the uh, the flower in the uh, river tipperati or or whatever it is and he just goes and fortunately for him he's attacked by villains who can then lead him to drax's base <laughs> but it is and there's even like a whole because the whole plot is kind of Bond following up these clues going from location to location to location and eventually they just kind of drop it because there's the bit it comes up to the Drax air freight thing yes. and Bond's like I'm going to investigate that rather than go to the airport he decides to go to some kind of mountain top tourist trap and look through uh, a telescope um, and then nothing really follows up from that. He just kind of meets back up with Q and, it, and Q's analyzed the vial that uh, Bond took from the laboratory half an hour ago. So the last half an hour of plot is kind of pointless. Well, that's, but, that's my problem. And, and I know we just done, did the whole Quantum of Solace thing where it gets a little mm. banged up for the plot points and the following, but Bond's got a logical A, B, C, D, E for this. Mm. And that's exactly the point where it breaks down for me with the air freight in Rio when he's watching that. And all of a sudden, he's in the ambulance and then the ambulance chase is done and then he's riding in a cowboy outfit and then he's in Q's lab and it's like, wait a minute, this is Bond porn. They're literally <laughs> setting up a scene to show you, you know, the money shot somewhere of something that they want to talk to you about as opposed to my favorite more films like Octopus. He's a great example. Mm. How the story and the plot and what Bond does, mm. like literally his accountability to his actions drives the story as opposed to look i'm in a cowboy outfit now and you're hearing the magnificent seven song Get it? <laughs> well like, i can't defend that <laughs> and by the way calvin that brings up something that i had an issue with especially this time watching moonraker hmm. i i will argue until bloody that Moore does serious very well those serious hmm. moments are my favorite moments with roger moore everybody thinks he's campy this film had trouble finding its footing on Am I campy or am I serious? Because they had some really good serious moments. And then, you know, all of a sudden, Bond, you know, knees, jaws, and you hear the clang. And, <laughs> you know, it's like, all right, so what are we going to be when we grow up? Mm, I, I do agree. That was another one of the points that I was going to bring up, actually, the kind of tonal issues. I mean, this is a film that has, I think you'd be hard pressed to find a scene in Bond as dark as when Corrine is being chased through the forest and the dogs are running after her and the music and all this kind of stuff. Really horrific scene. Equally, you have Bond inflating a gondola and then parading around a popular tourist destination in Venice. All right, um, so are we going to talk about that? Let's, let's get into it. Okay. I mean, I'm going to ask you first, are you okay with that whole scene? I, I love it for how silly it is. Um, right. I mean, I, I certainly cannot defend it from the standpoint of it you know, A, having, doing anything for the plot, <laughs> except for getting Bond out of a situation or it showing anything about Bond's character, anything like that. But it is so silly and probably as silly as Bond ever gets in any of the films. Yes. And I kind of just, I just laugh. I just enjoy it. I, I feel like, I don't feel like it's um, intended to be serious or anything like that. I think the filmmakers know that what they're doing is very silly. And it's kind of that, you're, you're being allowed in on the joke with the filmmakers. And I think that's right. what I respond to um, with it. But I, I don't so, know about you. <laughs> oh, you're going to, you're going to hear about me. <laughs> so as, as much fun. And I remember seeing this as a child when it first came out, mm. I loved that scene and I appreciate it for its campiness. Mm. This time around, I almost was upset because I think they went backwards. 
And I'll tell you why. In The Spy Who Loved Me, they do the lotus submarine scene. Mm -hmm. And Bond comes out of the water and he holds up the fish and he drops the fish. And you know, people, the guy drinking the wine, which is also the guy drinking the wine in this scene. I think they did that very well because it's a fun, funny moment that only lasts a couple seconds. So it doesn't take you out of this movie that there is danger involved mm. with our favorite spy. We don't want to see him hurt or others hurt around him. With this, it's just like, you know, the double taking pigeon, which I know is famous and I'm sure it was hard to get. Um, <laughs> but, but all of it, like, and it lasts so long. Like he's driving through town in a gondola that floats and he's a spy. He would have to quit after that because <laughs> everybody, it would be in every newspaper, on every TV, every tourist would be doing it. And it just makes no sense whatsoever. And they, I feel like they could have had a great, more subtle scene. And then instead they were just like, you know, Let, let's take this to science fact and just, <laughs> let's just go crazy. And I, yeah, I, it was a bad move. I, I, I do like, it does go to excess. Like I will admit that like, like you say, like with the, the Lotus, it's, well, you've got a couple of things in there, actually. You've got the guy with the bottle, you've got a guy smoking a pipe and the pipe falls out, you've got a dog that runs away, but it's all done so quickly in Spy Love Me. In Moonraker, we have dog looking on, we have drunk guy, we have a guy getting a drink poured on his head, we get the painter whose easel is blown out, we get the pigeon as well. So that's five things just off the top of my head, and there might even be more. Yeah. Um, it's and, slapstick. Yeah. Yeah. And all the while Bond is going nowhere. Like if you like see like from the, the big overhead shot, he's literally just parading <laughs> around. Uh, it's like, what are you getting out of this? <laughs> yeah. And the music as well, timed with the guys like throwing their guns down. It's very silly, but I have an awful lot of fun with it. Yeah, you do. I guess, I guess what it is, is like, I'm not a big fan of having a giant pickle with my ice cream on top. <laughs> Like, I love pickles and I love ice cream, but I kind of want them separated sometime. Mm, okay. This had well, both. Well, how do you respond to, um, to some of the darker scenes then? Do you like those or do you feel like those are tonally out of place as well? The scenes like Kareen running through the, um, the forest. I, I, I love them. So, to me, those are the most memorable ones. And even, you know, quite frankly, uh, Jaws with the clown ominously walking Ooh. down and they keep cutting back to her and the clown and it's coming closer. I mean, today, as I watch that, and I don't even have a fear of clowns, I'm fine with them. I, I just, it's so creepy and dark and wonderful uh, that I love those moments. It's when they have a de-evolution of those moments or even those characters. And I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about Jaws in a second, <laughs> but that's when I start to feel like, oh guys, really? Like you did that? I agree on as, yeah, um, it, it's strange because they have such fantastic setups and then like that Jaws scene, for instance, is like really horrific, really terrifying. You genuinely feel scared for this, this lady. And then they kind of, Jaws is all of a sudden goofy when a crowd comes out and he gets whisked away and all that kind of stuff. And you think like, oh, wow, if you hadn't got, have you, if you hadn't chosen to go the slapstick route with it, this could actually be really, it's on that knife edge of being like, if you didn't, do all these silly things. This could actually be one of the darker Bond films, which is very weird to think about now. But yeah, yeah. and and you know, I I don't know if it's one of your your topics, but I'll stay away from if it is. But Jaws. I mean, are we going to talk about Jaws? At all? Let, let's go. Yeah, no, it's a good so segue. I, I oh my gosh. So in the Spy Who Loved Me, Jaws was set up as this assassin. Mm. who literally rips people's throats out. He's very dark and there's some lighter moments, but you know, for the most part, dark and ominous. And because of, I guess, the kids' reactions, I don't know, we want, <laughs> we want Jaws to be a good, good, good guy. They made him into Wildy e. Coyote. <laughs> and they turned all of his things into pratfalls, pitfalls. And you know, like, you literally think he's gonna hold a, a sign that goes, yikes. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and because of that, they turned Jaws into a buffoon and then they, gave him a love interest. And, you know, mm. it just, to me, it just, again, it, this was almost like, I felt like the producer said, you know what we need to do to lighten up the mood in the world is let's have a, let's have a James Bond spoof. Mm. And we'll take all of our best characters and we will spoof them. And mm. Jaws is like one of those that are, they're spoofed. I would, I would argue that there's more of him 
as a lighter hearted character or a you know a more of light fun um at least in the spy who loved me than what most people remember i think he's there's a moment like he's really scary and creepy for a lot of the kind of first hour and then it gets to that point where he has that confrontation with bond and anya in the pyramids and he drops the the thing on his foot yes. and he does like a take and it's really from that point on that he starts to get a bit silly and then he's in the car later on he comes out and dust himself off and all that kind of stuff um i think it's there but i agree here it's to done to excess um but the seeds are sprouting i would say in his uh yeah first appearance and it was cartoony and that's the other mm. thing too with bond even my favorite more films whether it's octopussy live and let die or spy who love me those are my top three mm. they they stay away from the cartoon moments too much um mm. and and when they're inserted you know it's a little bit of a gut punch this just felt like it was a a constant gut punch oh wow <laughs> how okay, we well, doing <laughs> <laughs> well let's talk about actually because we're on the subject of villains i would like to talk mm. about um michael lonsdale as hugo drax who i think is a vast improvement on stromberg from the previous film i think he's a really talented actor does a lot without much as far as what is on the page, I don't know if he's that much different from Stromberg at all, as you were saying earlier on, their sort of aspirations, are, you know, cross out C, put space, and they're basically the same character. But it's what the actor brings to it. And I think that this actor really does well with the stoic, silent. And I think an actor like Christoph, Christoph Waltz in Spectre shows how difficult that is to do effectively, just to be really a commanding presence without actually saying all that much and just being there. Yeah. Um, and I think he really does achieve that. How do you feel about him? I will tell you that I have zero defense because oh. he is by far, by far, my favorite more villain out of oh, wow. all the more films, and he might be in my top three for the entire franchise. I was not and I'll tell you this. why. I'll tell you some of the reasons why I do like him, and, and I have zero defense, and that's why. Um, he, first of all, they introduce him towards the beginning of the film, which I love. You don't see him in the last 20 minutes like Dr. No, or halfway through like, you know, you know, in Skyfall. So you really get an establishment of him, and it's very Fleming that mm. he's a respected individual by the government, um, by his own people. So, you know, you don't know, you know, but you don't know he's this maniacal guy and it's Bond's frustration and trying to prove him that way. And I, I thought he was beautifully done. And then you have the actors who served up each line as this wonderfully slow, you know, meal that mm. you can just consume. And each line is a favorite line of mine. I, I, I don't know how many times I actually will repeat those lines in my real world events and nobody knows I'm quoting a bad guy. <laughs> he is fantastic down to his comeuppance and his oh, frustration yeah. with Bond. And, you know, his death is so satisfying. And, you know, he even jokes, I'm, I want to plan a satisfying death for you, Mr. Bond, you know, interesting death. His death is fantastic. Mm. And it was the one part in space that I said that served its purpose well from a plot standpoint. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Oh, he's I amazing. Oh, yeah. No, he's he's great. And again, this is another of the sort of elements that I think does improve on what I think The Spy Who Loved Me in some ways is a blueprint. Well, I mean, more than a blueprint, obviously, as you were saying. But I think that they looked at that and looked at, oh, okay, well, where can we improve on things here and there? And I think that his character is probably the big, the best example of that. And I think as you touched upon his death, the best Bond villain deaths are always when there's some kind of irony involved, like when sort of, you know, their own weapons can be used against them or Bond can trick them or something. In Spy Love Me, he just shoots Stromberg, kind of like point blank. Here, the whole thing with the space, the fact that he Bond kind of gets two kills in where he hits him with the wrist dart gun and then he invites him out into space. I think that's really cool. But also just the actor has some incredibly flowery lines of dialogue to deliver that on the page just look like what the hell is this but the actor just delivers it with such authority and yeah i, I think he does really terrifically he's one of my favorite elements yeah. of this film and he's scary he's certainly scarier than any of the henchmen like chang or or jaws in this which mm. i think i think chain and jaws they're both wild e coyote in just you know mm. different cultural backgrounds different heights and um but drax is scary and it's it's the slowness of his movements. 
know, he puts mm -hmm. his hands behind his back and he slowly walks towards the camera and then delivers his line in a very unrushed way. And it's like, ooh, like, mm. it's just so wonderfully maniacal. I love it. And he has that one moment where he does really raise his voice as well. And he says, expel them. And it's like, expel whoa. Them. Yeah, he it's loses his cool. Yeah, it's such, a, again, maybe it is a bit tonally jarring with a lot of the other stuff because it's a really quite a serious moment. And I, I, I like that moment. It's... But to me, that is, there are genius moments in Moonraker. Mm -hmm. I do like this film, right? So, <laughs> I mean, I, we, we're doing a debate here, but to me, that's a genius moment because it's almost like when your dad, who is very even keel, you know, he's mm -hmm. reading the newspaper, he's smoking his pipe, your dad is so, super even keel, doesn't raise his voice. That one time he raises his voice, you cry. Yep. You break down in tears and you poop yourself because <laughs> dad just raised his voice. That to me was like that. I'm like, whoa, he just lost his shit. Yep. I'm having flashbacks now. So. <laughs> Childhood. I just pooped my pants. <laughs> okay. I, I want to talk about, because uh, yeah, uh, that moment is obviously on the space station towards the end of the film. Um, how do you feel about, because I know this can be quite a polarizing subject, big battles at the end mm. of Bond films. Often Bond can kind of get lost in the mix um, when it's like, you know, a whole load of, it's usually American soldiers fighting the villain's personal army and Bond kind of has his own thing to do in the middle. Uh, Moonraker is one of my very favorite of those just huge scale battles. It's nuts. You have space marines like with lasers outside. Bond isn't even involved in that. It's just purely there for the sort of special effects spectacle. Um, how do you feel about that? I mean, it, it, the end battle is, it's bubble gum. And you know, the yeah. problem is you're not supposed to swallow bubble gum. Um, <laughs> I, I'll tell you how I feel about it, especially under, <laughs> under this watching. Um, I have some issues with it. First of all, it's clearly Thunderball in space. And mm. you know, you even get that moment where I'm glad they made, you know, the, the white and silver versus the yellow. Mm. Thunderball gets a little confusing sometimes, but I understand that the Bond producers really do lean on their formula. They have a winning formula and they also want to deliver to the fan like, hey, you're going for something comfortable and familiar. Mm -hmm. So this big battle with multiple people at the end has to be there. And again, they're replicating Star Wars. So you have to have you know, your stormtroopers and your rebels and, and lasers because all of a sudden Q Branch has lasers. <laughs> um, but where did the space Marines come from? Like, was this a Space Force, you know, program that was funded by the government just in case there was a battle station, which, by the way, a battle station, Death Star? Mm -hmm. um, to me, that was just so convenient. And, you know, it was like, all right, here they are, Space Marines, because we need to set up this big space battle. So I, I had some problems with it. Mm. Okay, no, I, yeah, I, I completely accept that i uh, but you know bubblegum is still really nice while you're while you're chewing it which I it's, think it's amazing it's amazing <laughs> it's a it's an it's a nice activity if you can do it my yeah. my other issue with this and this is this is how as an adult as a 52 year old you start thinking of these things what happened to all the good guys and bad guys that were fighting out in space at the end like you don't see them taking off and you've got the ones that are on the space station but but I, are they just out there floating around that is a very good question. <laughs> Never, maybe they all died. And by the way, I will tell you, I will give you, this is my burnt offering that I give you. <laughs> there were some really, I, I think, very effective moments during that fight. Like when you see somebody spinning off into space, or you see them get hit and the air valve breaks, which is you know directly from a Thunderball thing when the air valve breaks yeah. underneath. But you do really like think about the bigness of space and John Barry's score. Mm. while this is playing is so monumental and it just f makes it feel very big and epic because mm. of that. I agree, actually. I'm glad you brought up the score because that was another uh, topic that I wanted to cover because I feel like it's certainly not the most kind of blood pumping, exhilarating of Bond scores, but I feel like he's clearly being influenced by 2001, for instance, and some of these sort of more classical sounding pieces, particularly when Bond and Goodhead is uh, first flying into space. I think that's a beautiful piece of music when yeah. you, you have the, the space shuttle coming towards the camera and the sunlight just coming up behind. It's fantastic. Um, so, and from that perspective, it is one of my favorite John Barry scores, actually, even though, like I say, I think some of it can be a bit 
there's that scene on the speedboats where Bond is being chased by Jaws and we get a reprise of the, um, the 007 theme. Mm. And it's so slow and so plodding. And it's like, should I be feeling excited now? Or is this just like, uh, yeah, I don't really know uh, if it's intended that way or not. How did you feel? I, I did like it. I do like, and John Barry's score here, I think is very effective. You know what it made me think of when you go to like a planetarium uh, on a mm. school trip and you're watching the stars and they have this very big, you know, almost operatic music when they talk about stars in space because space mm. should be mysterious and so huge. And so it was incredibly effective in conveying that. To your point, it's not pulse, you know, you know, driving or anything like that, but I actually think it was okay. Mm. My, my one ding that I'll give Moonraker is it's hard. I'd be hard pressed if you set up a, um, 10 scores in a row, like a lineup, mm. like a police lineup, and you played something from Moonraker other than the space music, mm. I'd have trouble picking it out as Moonraker. Oh, I really would. Because, mm. I mean, you've got the, uh, you know, the, the, you know, as the woman's traveling through the thing, and, yeah. you know, you've got the major theme that I could pick out, but everything else seemed almost invisible, mm. like background, um, which maybe is effective, but that's, it's my one little ding. Okay, that's interesting. I, I, small. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now I, it, it's yeah. No, I, I've often quite. When you just said background, then I was like, oh no, actually, when I play it, it's often just like in the background as I'm like, you know, cooking or something. It's just this kind of nice, relaxing lull, um, which is quite nice. Earlier on, just while we're going back to the ending as well, because earlier on you kind of alluded to a shot by shot sort of like Star Wars uh, comparison. Were you talking about the very ending with the where Bond needs to shoot the globes? Uh, I mean, there was, even when they're going to the, to the um, space station, you know, and they see it, there's a whole discussion that goes on that's just like in Star Wars when Obi-Wan is in the Falcon and he goes, you know, that's, that's no moon, it's a space station. There's, there's a lot of very, very similar comparisons, even like the view of it as they're approaching. Mm. But yes, the, the very end of it with the whole targeting, you know, he can't use the targeting, you know, use the false, Luke. <laughs> you know, trust yourself, Luke. It's like, I almost wanted to hear that over the pipelines. Um, so yeah, that just... I've never picked up on that as they're approaching before, but you're absolutely right. That's it, isn't it? That's the yeah. kind of blueprint for that whole sequence. It's like, oh, that's no moon. And uh... He actually says, it's no moon, that's a space station. Mm. And then he says, it's a space station. It's like almost word for word. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I've always kind of fixated on when they're going for the globes at the end. And that's, the, you know, they're using the targeting computer and then yeah. there's some lip service to, oh, it's overheating. We need to do the manual thing, which is such a, like in Star Wars, it actually means something for Luke to switch off the targeting computer. It's the whole point of it is that they use yeah. the force and, you know, and all this. Whereas in Moonraker, it's kind of like a, yeah, you maybe you could have just left the targeting, you know, computer on, and maybe that would have been just as good. It's uh, it's not as effective. Even the blaster fight on on the inside, like when they're you know using the blasters and stuff like that. A ah, lot, that's yeah. so cool. Love it. Ah, a lot of the that's sound effects um, were just really almost like the Star Wars sound effects, you know, mm. that they that they used. And I get that they had to establish, you know, laser guns and things like that in the cube mm. branch, but that's where to me it seemed very science fiction y. It went from, you know, science fact to science fiction <laughs> and back again. Yeah. I love seeing that interview of Cubby Broccoli just like intercut with bits from the film. Cause it's like what part of factual do you think this really is, really? Uh you know, that was a meeting internally at Eon where they were sitting around going, you know what, if we call it science fiction, they're going to make too many comparisons to Star Wars. I yeah. got it. Yeah. yeah. No, we're doing something completely factual here. It yeah. could happen in the not so distant future. It's happening but, right now. Yeah. <laughs> um, the last thing that I have on my list, hmm. so feel free to bring up any more points that you want to sure. make after this, but uh, I think it's got one of the very best ending sequences with Bond and the Bond girl on the whatever mode of transportation they're on. But Q's whole line about, I think he's attempting re-entry, sir. Love it. It's fantastic. I've seen this film in the cinema like twice. Always gets a huge laugh from the audience. It's a fantastic response to that. You a fan? Did you like it? Did you like it when they did it in The Spy Who Loved Me when he said, keeping the British end up, sir? <laughs> I mean, they're in a bed, they're yeah. having sex, 
Now I get it that by by now when they did Moonraker, it was probably a Roger Moore, you know, patent pending, need to have him in a bed, and he's interrupted. But I mean, you know, you, you've got it over and over. You've got it in for your eyes only. I mean, you know, it's it it becomes almost cliched. I get mm. it, and it was effective. I mean, mm. it was effective to me. Like the starting with the music right after there was kind of jarring. Mm. You know, when they immediately jump into the song itself, it was a little bit jarring. But this is just one of those points where it was like, okay. And I get it. Like, what are you going to do? You know, here they are traveling around and stuff like that. Now, it does harken back to the Connery era where he's in boats constantly and he doesn't want to be rescued. And you know, even in Brosnan with, with Wei Lin, where, you know, he's wants he doesn't want to be rescued and tomorrow never dies. So it is mm. a bondish thing. Mm. So I, I'm not going to fall on a sword for it, but I don't think I can fall in love with it either. Oh, I thought you were really going to love that. That's like, uh, I love that okay. line. <laughs> okay. I think by now I was probably at this point at the end of the film and I'll bring up something else. I just was so dismayed at the fact that, you know, I do like the turn of Jaws, which I thought was very Empire Strikes Back-ish, mm. um, where, uh, sorry, uh, Return of the Jedi, which I know hadn't premiered yet. But this whole turning of Jaws, I, I actually quite like that. And I know mm. I just got <laughs> done arguing about him being a serious bad guy, but I do like the turn because it made sense. I mean, Dolly mm. and him do not follow the pattern of, you know, Bo Derek, you know, being a 10 mm. and the rest of the people. But I just thought it was a little bit strange how Dolly and him are celebrating, you know, they have that, you know, here's to you, kid. Mm. But, and, and they're, <laughs> they're literally barreling into space <laughs> and bond is like eh, they'll be fine they <laughs> saved our lives and he had a real turn of heart they'll be fine but you never see them again <laughs> like no you could see jaws in outer space like help <laughs> help by the way i was gonna oh, stick amazing. i was gonna stick these in um i cannot get these things in my mouth they're too big i think richard keel could barely do it Oh, that's Jesus! Yeah, that is. Oh my I, god! I can't. I will break my jaw. Yeah, I mean, I know it, they almost broke his jaw. He could only have them in for like a few, like a minute at a time or something. It's well, it's it's got like you can see on the inside, it's got like teeth print. Oh wow! And are those from the original sort of molds? Or? No, these are um, the, the ones from the original mold are downstairs. I have them. Mm. These are just kind of replicas, um, but they're 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 the right size and shape and kind of dental jam, if you will. Amazing. Ah, uh, that's so cool. Yeah. It's amazing. Well, how, did you, how did you, I mean, you haven't really talked about it. What did you think of the relationship between uh, Jaws and Dolly? Um, it's really silly. Don't get me like, it's, it's bafflingly how they just kind of fall in love in that one instance based on very little. She doesn't have mm. braces. We should point that out right now. <laughs> she does definitely not have braces. She's never had braces. She doesn't. No. Um, but I think that the moment where he sort of turns makes a lot more sense. In the novelization, the Christopher Wood novelization, Dolly is not a character in this. So Jaws's oh, wow. turn is very, is really out of nowhere. It's like, well, wait, wh where is this coming from? Whereas in the film, because they've established his relationship with her, it gives him a reason to want to, you know, change and go on to Bond's side instead. And I think it's a really effective moment. Um, I'd love to know what conversation the pair of those had after their first meeting because it's literally a few days later she's on the space station with him <laughs> and uh, he must have been very convincing to get the her. second they meet they're holding hands when he goes through that seven yeah. up sign in rio she he grabs her hand and she's all smiles i'm like what how's this gonna work he's gonna yeah. crack her like a potato chip in bed yeah <laughs> i mean that's not gonna go well uh, i can't imagine what the hickeys would be like with like those teeth as well like oh, good good point I think they be... should have given her braces. I thought that would have been a creative idea. It would have made more sense if she did reveal yeah. her teeth and then he reveals his teeth and then it's like, oh, this is our yeah. connection with each other. But yeah. Two, two points I will say. Um, one mm. point, because I lived during the time of this and mm. I lived through Star Wars and then subsequently this film is I, I do have to applaud the producers and the marketers for the most amazing, truly amazing marketing campaign. They had mm. tons of toys they had figures, dolls, space guns. They had, I remember they had space outfits and helmets. Um, 
they had Seiko watches that, you know, you could buy the watch in the theater. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I've done a study actually of the marketing campaign for Moonraker and it's second to none. I mean, huh. it, and, and listen, Mea Copa, hand on heart, it, it was a phenomenal success. It made mm-hmm. a ton of money, as you know, it was the number one Bond film up until then. And actually dollar for dollar up until GoldenEye premiered it was still the number one Bond film. So it was incredibly popular. Mm. Um, I think the producers knew that they maybe went a bridge too far with, I'll use your words, the sensationalism, Mm. you know, the excess. And that's why For Your Eyes Only transpired because it's like, we kind of need to come back to earth and have a little, little bit of a palate cleanser here. And the series does that every now and then. It's, you know, going from Young Live Twice to Majesties, this to Fiora Eyes Only, Dine of the Day to Casino Royale. It, it feels like that is kind of the process because they eventually push it to a point where, oof, we can't go much further than this, you know. And, and certainly this is probably about as excessive as Bond could ever go to like actually go into outer space, a space station, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, so I understand that course correction. Um, I didn't know that, the, that about the marketing uh, so much, but that's, it makes a lot of sense as to why this one was such a... This is actually one of the watches that you could buy in the theater itself. Jesus. And this is the one he wears, um, correct band and everything, to uh, you know, blow up that little grating to get them out of you know, before the rocket goes off. That's fantastic. So, and and I, you know what? Listen, I cannot ding this movie because a, a lot of people are like, oh my gosh, from a style portion, he's got the giant, you know, collars and, you know, he's all this stuff, but it's fine from a style standpoint. He pulls his pants a little high. It's kind of like the Clint Eastwood, like, get off my lawn, you know, <laughs> um, school of art as far as pants are concerned. But um, I can't really ding him on style. Everybody wanted him to wear, of course, a Rolex, but... You know, they ha- they went for the product placement. I have no problem with that. How do you feel about the uh, the space suits? Sexy as hell. Man. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, can you really ding anybody for having a spacesuit with yellow Converse? No, nope. I think that's and fantastic. Way, how, how do you not own a pair of yellow high top Converse? Yeah, I really should actually. Uh, yeah, but then I'd need to you know complete the whole look. Uh, oh, because that would start a snowball of you wanting to... Yeah, yeah, exactly. I don't even have a Moonraker laser. I've got my golden gun, but that's that's about it. I should have got one of those. You don't have the white Uzi? The white, no. uh... I, sh- I should have gone in for it when they were still out there. But, yeah. They, they can be had. <laughs> I know, I'll need to go scuffing around some black market, maybe, for... <laughs> Dare to dream. Dare to dream. Yeah. So, all right. So, how did we do? I... I, I have a feeling that I have not won you over as much as perhaps you did with me on Quantum of Solace. Uh, and I feel like that's because I'm very much aware that a lot of my joy of Moonraker is kind of indefensible. Like, I, I have to accept all of the criticisms and all of the tonally jarring moments, the silly moments, the outlandishness, all that kind of stuff. But it, it all just comes down to the fact that I do have an awful lot of fun watching this film. And I'm sure a good part of that comes from it was the first Bond film I ever saw. So this kind of set the scene for me for what to expect. But I, I, I like it even more now than I did a few years ago, actually. Um, it's always been relatively high ranking, but recently I feel like, no, it's, it really is one of my absolute, if I was on a desert island, I would, it would have to be one of the ones that I took with me. And I enjoy it too. Um, You know, this is a debate and we're having fun with it. I think there is something very wonderful and very emotional about not having to defend a Bond movie that you really enjoy because there are some things that probably shouldn't, shouldn't be described. I mean, you should have something, and maybe I'm being a romantic with this stuff, but you want something that is indescribable. You know, you want something that touches you, but I don't need to defend it. Um, and I don't need to be able to describe it because I know it. I feel it. And I, I feel that way about several of the Bond films that, for me, like Tomorrow Never Dies. I love Tomorrow Never Dies. And a lot of people look at me like, <laughs> are you sure you're talking about Tomorrow Never Dies? And I'm like, you know what? Just something, it takes me on a ride that I just love. And I have a smile from, you know, from A to Z. And I think it's like that with Moonraker. And by the way, um, I could watch Moonraker, you know, once a month and I wouldn't, you know, to me, it's not, trust me, it's not view to a kill and it's not never say never again. Mm. Um, 
I really do enjoy it. But I, I, I was able to pretty easily find some issues with it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's definitely, it's nitpickable for sure. Like it, it, Maybe it's that's the that. charm. I, I, I think it is to a degree. You know, I mean, a, a, there's a double taking pigeon for goodness sake, like, yeah. it's the silliest like thing that Bond has ever done. But and I do kind of get some joy out of it. Some people want to adopt, and I love this. Some people want to adopt three-legged dogs. You know, they mm. don't want to adopt a you know a you know a dog that's perfect because uh -huh. it's like you know I I have so much heart for this three-legged dog, and this three-legged dog doesn't know it's a three-legged dog. Just like Moonraker doesn't know that it's a fallible you know kind of meh Bond movie. It just doesn't know. That is the best analogy for Moonraker I've ever heard. The three-legged dog of the James Bond series. That is fantastic. I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh, I love that. I don't think it can get any better than that. So I'm going to say thank you for joining me for this conversation, David. It's been I had lovely. so much fun. Oh, good. No, me too. It, it was a really fun discussion. So I, uh, yeah, I don't know if people can let us know in the comment section where they stand on Moonraker, if they think either of us made more convincing points, but please do let us know in the comment section below. And uh, yeah, until next time. So long. Calvin, here's to you, kid. <laughs>